Hello, and welcome to Music Royalties 101. In this presentation, we'll explain what royalties and copyrights are and how they work, the different types of music royalties and how they generate income, how money flows through the music industry, and a bit about the history of royalty earnings over time. So let's get started. So first, what is a royalty and how are royalties different than other types of investments? A royalty is a payment made to the owner of an asset for the right to use that asset. In the music business, songs are licensed for various types of use, and those uses generate royalties. A royalty interest is the right to collect on a stream of royalty payments. In the music business, multiple people who contribute to the creation of a song have a royalty interest in that song and collect those royalties as compensation for their efforts. Anytime that song is used, those who own royalties attached to it will collect royalty payments depending on their contribution to the song and how it's used. From an investment perspective, royalties are a cut off the top of the revenues generated by music. They are paid out at set specified intervals, payment is based on use, not company performance, and all this means that the royalty holder earns revenue before stockholders in a company. Royalties are not awarded based on the whim of a corporate board, like a dividend for instance. So think of a royalty like earning a penny for every iPhone sold versus a share of Apple stock. The music business generates multiple types of royalties, and each royalty stream is dependent on the kind of copyright they are associated with. Every song has two copyrights, one for the song as it is written, and one for the song as it is recorded. Take, for instance, the song Knockin' on Heaven's Door, written and performed by Bob Dylan. The musical composition copyright covers a song as it is written by the songwriter. This is the person who wrote the melody, notes, lyrics, etc. Once that song is recorded, another copyright is generated called the sound recording copyright. The person or the band who records the song owns the, the recording copyright. In some cases, the songwriter and the performer are the same person, such as in this case. But often, multiple songwriters may assist in writing the songs, and all will have a royalty interest on the use of the composition copyright. Also, as in this case, other artists may record the song, and they will own and collect royalties on the sound recording copyright for the version they record, but only the songwriter, in this case Bob Dylan, will collect the composition royalties for those versions other than his own. We'll get into more of that in a minute. But first, let's talk about what types of royalties pay to these two copyrights. Both the sound recording and the composition copyrights generate royalties based on how the songs and recordings are used. These include synchronization royalties, reproduction or mechanical royalties, and performance royalties. We're going to get into what each of these are in a moment, but for now you can see that both the sound recording and the composition copyright holder earns royalties for these uses. Finally, there are different entities that collect and distribute the royalties generated by each copyright. Songwriters sign with publishers or use publishing administration services for their royalties, and artists sign with labels or use distribution services for theirs. As you can see here, Bob Dylan's record label, Columbia Records, collects the royalties for the sound recording copyright of the song and pays Dylan according to his contract with the label. In this example, we're focusing on the original studio recording. Now, if there was a live recording uh, by Bob Dylan of the same song, that would create yet another master sound recording copyright and that live version would collect royalties in the same way as the studio version, but only for uses of the live version versus the studio version. Now for the composition, Dylan's publishers, Sony ATV and Ram's Horn Music, hold the composition copyright for the song, and they pay Dylan his share of royalties based on his publishing agreement with them. Now there can only be one composition copyright for a song, but one song could have multiple master recordings. So let's look at the Guns N' Roses version of the same song, Knocking on Heaven's Door. At the left, you'll see that we changed the version of the recorded song from Bob Dylan to Guns N' Roses. And as you can see here, Guns N' Roses and their label, Geffen Records, collect the sound recording royalties for the version of the song that they recorded. Bob Dylan and his publisher, meanwhile, collect the composition royalties because Guns N' Roses used his original composition for their recording. Bob Dylan does not collect royalties for the Guns N' Roses sound recording. Only Guns N' Roses collects that, but Bob Dylan does collect on the composition. So let's talk about how these agreements and rights work. Here's an overview of the composition copyright. Again, the composition copyright collects royalties for sync rights, mechanical rights, and performance rights. These royalties are split between the publisher's share and the writer's share. Typically, a songwriter will sign with a publisher in what's called a publishing deal. In these deals, the publisher winds up owning the copyright and in return has the task of exploiting the copyright to generate royalties through sync, mechanical, and performance rights. That means they'll work to license the music to generate sync income and ensure that anyone selling or streaming the music has permission to do so. All royalties generated from the composition copyright are split between the publisher and the songwriter. Typically, it's 50-50 for performance royalties, uh, but mechanical and sync splits can vary by the label deal, or by the publisher deal, rather. 
Sometimes multiple songwriters work with the same publisher, in which case the publisher will keep half of the royalties and the songwriters will split the other half between themselves based on internal split agreements. And in still other cases, a songwriter might be self-published, and in which case they'll collect all of the royalties. Now the sound recording copyright works a little bit differently. Typically, artists sign a contract with a record label. The label provides an advance and the recording infrastructure for artists to record their album. In return, the label will own the sound recording copyright. Any royalties the sound recording copyright earns is collected by the label, and then the label pays the artist a percentage of the royalties based on their, their contractual agreement. This can be like 15% to the artist, or it could be far more. The, the range varies widely. Some artists don't work with a record label, taking what's called the DIY route, or indie route. These artists use digital distribution services to get their music on various digital services and then either conduct their own marketing and promotion or hire services or consultants to do it for them. Either way, they collect all of the royalties, the sound recording royalties that they generate. Finally, recording artists will also hire other musicians and producers that are not formally part of the band to contribute to the recording. These musicians and producers may also be awarded a portion of the royalties as compensation for their contribution to the recording. Now a quick note about copyright terms, and by terms we mean the length of time that the copyright is valid. Royalties are only paid for as long as the copyright is in force. Once the copyright expires, the asset enters the public domain and no royalties are paid for them. But one of the greatest advantages to owning a music royalty attached to a copyright is the length of time the copyright remains in force. For music created after 1977, the duration of copyright in the U.S. is the lifetime of the last remaining author, plus 70 years. Music before then is governed by different rules depending on when the music was created, but the maximum copyright length under the old rules was 95 years after creation. Now, let's break down in greater detail each of the different types of royalties we've outlined. First, we'll dig into public performance royalties due to the songwriter, as this is the most common royalty stream we make available to investors on the royalty exchange marketplace. A public performance license and royalty payment is necessary whenever a song is played or performed publicly outside of a private circle of family or friends. That means if you're having a barbecue and you play music through your backyard speakers, you don't owe a music uh, royalty for public performance. But if you're at a barbecue restaurant that is streaming music into the dining area, that restaurant owner does. Public performance royalties collect from multiple sources. These include radio stations, TV networks, bars and clubs, restaurants, music venues, and streaming sites like Pandora or Spotify. All of these pay public performance royalties as a regular cost of doing business. Uh, if the business in any way, shape, or form plays music as a way to enhance their business to the public, they are required by law to obtain a public performance license from the copyright holder. However, there are differences with the composition rights holder and the sound recording rights holder in terms of how they collect public performance royalties. For the musical composition, Publishers and songwriters outsource the licensing and collection of public performance royalties to collection organizations such as ASCAP or BMI. These companies are known as performing rights organizations, otherwise known as PROs. Their activity covers all sources of public performance royalties that I mentioned, but only for songwriters and publishers on the composition side. In the U.S., the sound recording copyright only collects public performance royalties for radio streamed via satellite and the Internet. Record companies and performing artists typically outsource the licensing and collection of these public performance royalties to an organization called SoundExchange, although some have struck direct deals with the services as well. It's worth noting that in the U.S., the sound recording copyright holder does not collect royalties for music played over terrestrial radio. Only the composition rights holder receives that public performance royalty. This is unique to the U.S. and a handful of other countries like Iran and North Korea. This means that for songs recorded in the United States, radio airplay in other countries also will likely not result in royalties for the sound recording copyright since there's no reciprocal agreement with those countries. Now, there is no finite royalty rate or mathematical formula available to the public to calculate exactly what each performance of a song earns. The royalties and payments are negotiated and determined by the performing rights organizations, again, ASCAP and BMI. So now let's talk about mechanical royalties. These are how songwriters are compensated when the music they write is in any way reproduced and sold. This includes the sale of a vinyl record, a CD, a digital download, and even streams on Spotify and Apple Music. The term mechanical harkens back to the day when the main way to listen to music was through player pianos. Rolls of perforated paper were created that once inserted into the piano told it which notes to play. This required machines to mechanically press the piano rolls in order to produce a song into multiple copies of sound recordings to sell to the public. In other words, the composition was mechanically reproduced. 
that term stuck and over time it has applied to vinyl records and then cassette tapes, CDs, digital downloads and now even streaming. So whenever an artist or a record company wants to reproduce a song through a sound recording, they have to pay a mechanical royalty to the owner of the composition copyright. For instance, earlier we explained how Guns N' Roses recorded Bob Dylan's Knocking on Heaven's Door. Whenever that song is sold or streamed, GNR, Guns N' Roses, must pay a mechanical royalty to Bob Dylan and his music publisher. So essentially, when an artist covers someone else's song and releases it on their album, or when an artist writes their own song, the record company owes the artist a mechanical royalty. The amount of that payment depends on the format. Uh, the statutory rate for the mechanical royalty today is at 9.1 cents per song per album copy for all physical albums and digital downloads. Financially, this, this means that for every million albums or songs sold, the mechanical royalty generates around $91,000 in earnings for the songwriter or publisher. Now, the mechanical royalty rate for a streaming song is much lower. It's calculated at about 0 0.0006 cents per song. Now, mechanical royalty rates are set every so often by a group of federal judges called the Copyright Royalty Board. Every few years, they take input from both the services and the artists and determine a new rate schedule for the years ahead. There are different hearings for each type of format that pay mechanical royalties, streaming, sales, and so on. The most recent hearing for streaming mechanical royalties was in 2018, and the CRB ruled that streaming services would have to increase the rate that it pays songwriters and publishers for both mechanical and publishing royalties from 10.5% of their annual revenues to 15.1% at a rate that increases 1% a year from 2019 through 2022. Overall, that's a 44% increase over those four years. However, some of the streaming services, like Spotify and Amazon in particular, are appealing that ruling. Now let's talk about sync royalties. If you've ever watched a TV show or a commercial or seen a movie or streamed a video online, you've probably noticed the amount of music that's used. Well, the use of this music has a cost, and the payments made for the rights to use music in this way is called a sync royalty. The term sync is used because the producers have to pay a licensing fee to synchronize the songs or the music to their video. This means that any time there's a marriage of music and visual images, a sync license is necessary. The sync right is licensed from the music publisher for the musical composition. If the recording is also used, then a master use license is required from the record company for the actual sound recording. It's an important distinction because in some cases only the composition is used, like when a character is singing a song versus the actual recording that the artist made. Now there are no set rates for sync licenses. They are fully negotiable with custom rates for each use. Uh, factors can include the popularity of the song, the budget of the TV film uh, production, the stature of the artist, as well as other factors like the timing and prominence of the song in a particular scene. Um, now, it's also worth noting that uh, sync licenses also lead to a second income stream, which we already discussed, performance royalties. Each time a song is used in a TV or film production, the initial sync fee is paid up front. It's a one-time fee, which is just for the rights to place the song in the production. But then whenever the production is broadcast on TV or film or whatever, then it generates a public performance royalty. So with a really great sync placement, a song can get bonus money on top of the initial fee. So those are the main types of royalties. Now we're going to look at how the money actually flows in each case. For public performance royalties due on the composition copyright, which you'll remember is paid to the publisher and songwriter, the entity performing the music publicly, like the radio station, the TV venue, or the service, uh, pays a public performance royalty to an organization called the PRO, which we discussed earlier. These companies do all the work of monitoring and collecting public performance royalties, and then pay their members, both publishers as publishers and songwriters, directly. For a public performance royalties due on the sound recording, the different organization called Sound Exchange does the collecting. Satellite radio, webcaster, internet radio stations pay the performance royalty to Sound Exchange, and Sound Exchange plays the artist 50%, the label 45%, and then will pay 5% to a fund set up through SAG AFTRA to pay background musicians and session musicians and things like that. Now, on the reproduction side, the mechanical royalty due the songwriter and publisher is paid differently depending on the format. For on demand streaming services, the service will pay the publisher directly, and the publisher will pay the songwriter their cut based on their agreement. For more retail sales, like digital or physical sales, generally the retailer pays the label, and the label then passes on the royalty to the publisher, who then pays the songwriter. Now for the sound recording, 
the reproduction royalties are a little bit more straightforward. Both the on-demand streaming services and the retailers will pay the label, and the label pays the band or the artist and supporting artists per their contract. The artist cuts can vary widely from anywhere from 12% of incoming royalties to even 50% or more. It depends on the deal and the stature of the artist. Now, sync licenses are also pretty simple. The producer of the ad or the TV show or whoever simply pays the sync license to the music publisher who then pays the songwriter. And if they're using a master recording, the same people will pay the master use license to the record label who then pays the artist. Finally, let's take a quick look at how the different types of royalties contribute to overall music industry revenues and how each has grown over the years. The IFPI is the global trade organization for record labels and produces an annual report on the state of the industry with tracks a lot of this. Here you'll see the most recent chart tracking sound recording revenues, which includes all of 2019 data. It's a great chart because it shows not only the total royalty earnings, but also the source of royalties and both the growth rates and contribution levels they provide over uh, year over year. As you can see, sound recording royalties have rebounded from their low of 2014 to increase annually every year since. For 2019, total revenues for the global recorded music market grew by 8.2% to $20.2 billion. Streaming revenues, as indicated by the dark blue bars, uh, grew by 22.9% to $11.4 billion. And that's notable because for the first time, streaming has accounted for more than half of global recorded music revenue at 56.1%. Now, physical sales have fallen by 5.3%, as indicated by the red bars, and download sales, digital downloads, as indicated by the lighter blue bar, uh, are both also falling. And public performance and sync, as represented by the yellow and orange bars, respectively, they're largely uh, flat or even year over year, but if you look at them historically, you'll see that they're higher than their historic levels. Now, there's less data available globally for publishing. The uh, National Music Publishers Association uh, reports on U.S. publishing figures, which is what we'll show here, and it's thanks to a compilation of data provided by the trade news organization Music Business Worldwide. According to the NMPA, music publishers in the U.S. generated $3.72 billion in revenues in 2019, which is up 11.6% year-on-year. Looking at what contributes to that, 52.3% of that figure uh, came from performance royalties, 18.5% about uh, 497 million came from mechanical royalties and 22.7 came from synchronization royalties. Now, let's look at public performance royalties specifically. If you remember, we said that public performance royalties are collected and distributed by organizations called PROs. This chart here shows what the two largest US PROs reported over the years, ASCAP and BMI. Uh, now, these two organizations report on different fiscal year time frames, so they don't exactly match up time-wise, but generally you can see that both have surpassed $1 billion in public performance royalty distributions for the past three years, and each year uh, in that time has set an all-time high. <clears throat> now, it's also worth noting that public performance royalties are generated from multiple sources. This chart shows uh, how the public performance earnings, as reported by BMI, breaks down in terms of source. Might be a little hard to read, so you'll see here that cable and satellite represent the biggest bucket at 30%, while digital sources like streaming, for instance, uh, come in uh, very close second at 28%. Uh, TV and radio broadcast is at 24%, and uh, you know venues, live events, bars, restaurants, and etc. come in 18%. Now that's on royalties uh, that BMI collects, which is uh, includes a lot of uh, newer music, the kind of music that we don't necessarily make available on Royalty Exchange. We did our own analysis and found that basically uh, digital was by far uh, for the royalties acquired on Royalty Exchange, digital was by far the uh, leading source of earnings for public performance royalties, whereas venues and um, TV and satellite and things like that were actually closer to 1%, largely because the music acquired on Royalty Exchange is older, uh, the bands are less likely to be touring, although many still are, um, and just generally it's, it's the kind of royalties that you're looking at on Royalty Exchange are um, driving most of the revenue from streaming. So that's the overview and some context into music royalties. We hope this helps you understand the activity behind your music royalty investments a little better. If you'd like to dig in further, we do have a few resources for you. Uh, one is that you can download the Ultimate Guide to Buying Music Royalties, which is available on our website. Uh, you could always register for one of our office hours Q&A sessions, which we hold monthly, and you can ask any question you like, either in advance or live during the call. Uh, we do have a, a rather broad investor resources library on our website from our blog. Just go to blog and look for the investor resources section. You'll see a number of articles that will be very helpful for you. And you could always, of course, subscribe to our Marketplace Update newsletter, which we send once a week. That includes um, all the different types of royalties that are currently available on the site, the activity on the site, and also links to some uh, news articles that might help you keep track of the uh, you know, weekly changes and uh, what's happening in the music business. 
So with that, thank you for watching. We look forward to seeing you on the Royalty Exchange Marketplace.